This is the audio podcast. It's episode 135. Insert Swift History. It's uh, November 20th, 2014. It's almost like Christmas and stuff like that. But that's not the main excitement, is it, Adam? No, it is not. Welcome, everyone, to the audio podcast for today. Uh, and we've got um, our usual kind of news and plunder, but we also have a special guest, and we will introduce her very shortly. Let me just do the contact blah, which is that you can get in contact with us here at the audio podcast uh, via email, show at theaudiopodcast.co.uk, or Twitter is another decent way of of uh, getting in contact, that's at the audio podcast, and you can follow the show notes, which we follow live, that's the audio podcast.co.uk forward slash show, forward slash 135. Scott, I hope you have refreshed your notes page. Ooh, oh, it's always like the pressure of live note making. Well, our special guest this week is Emily Richards of CC Mixiter, which is a website that I guess will be familiar to some of our, our users. But um, it's a great pleasure to have you join us uh, this week, Emily. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. That's cool. And for, the, for people who don't know what CC Mixiter is, could you tell us a little bit about it? CC Mixiter is an open source open music platform. So the software is open source, but so is the music. So we've modeled um, the way we built our music around open source software platforms. That's sort of what inspired it. So instead of just going to find a repository of music that's licensed Creative Commons, which it is, um, also all the stems are available under Creative Commons. So it makes it very interactive and a great place to find wonderful music. And we're a, an international community, about 5,000 artists. And so we, uh, we experience creation through the, the universal language together. Awesome. So I'm going to ask the, uh, I'm going to just ask for the, the obvious clarification, I guess. So what you're saying is it's a place where I can legally listen to other people's music without paying for it and even more excitingly I can also remix it and r make something new using it as kind of source material to start with. Yeah, so you can listen. Um, you could participate, so if you're a musician, if you make beats, if you're a poet, um, you can come and join the community and, and be part of the collaboration. Or if you're a DJ, you could come and remix a vocal or use a beat in your own creation. And then you can also use all of our music in videos and podcasts and films and apps and games. And because it's all Creative Commons, as long as it's a non-commercial endeavor, all you have to do is attribute. If you want to use it commercially, then uh, we also have a new license called CC Plus, which enables that. Awesome. And why would I ever dream of giving away my music for free? Well, um, I've been doing it my most of my career, and it's worked out quite well for me. Um, I did start out in the whole traditional majors do an, you know, I did an album in Nashville, one in LA, in, in big studios, and in a traditional manner, which was uh, was great. Um, but you're really reliant upon a major label and their marketing budget to get your music out there, and you have to pay back that marketing budget. So your music itself can become your marketing budget. So instead of spending a million dollars promoting an album, you just give away a million downloads, and it has um, perhaps even a better effect because um, the impact. Um, is more personal because people are interacting with your music instead of just hearing it on a radio ad or um, in a magazine or something like that. So I think you give away, I give away my music one because I believe I make music so it can be heard and because it puts the tools and the power and the control of your content in your own hands. And, and instead of losing the rights to your music, which so many musicians do when they sign with a major label, you retain your rights. And um, with Creative Commons, whatever you create, you still own the copyright to. You're just allowing a, a license on top of that that gives people a chance to interact. I mean, in today's media, is music is so much a part of everything and people want more and more music so why not make it available to them instead of locking it down it creates more opportunity that was a long-winded answer 
I, I thought it was a great one. I, I suspect that many of our listeners will uh, detect it was a slightly contrived answer for myself because the audio podcasters were Creative Commons licensed ourselves. So oh. we're, uh, <laughs> cool. We're all into giving it away, but we, uh, you know, we, I thought it was the right sort of question. Adam, do you have any uh, yourself? Any thought yourself? Well, yeah. Um, so uh, as I understand it, um, the, the, to be honest, I, I personally didn't know really anything about CC Mixter until. Uh, S Scott kind of introduced the fact that you were going to be on the show and then straight away I thought of Blend uh, which is actually very new um, in relation to CC Mixter it's quite a new service uh, how, how does it compare with Blend is it a, a kind of a rival or is it similar or do they actually really cover completely different bases you know I haven't used Blend so I'm not equipped to answer that what does Blend do no, maybe I could tell you. Um, blend, it, it's maybe more a kind of, rather than the um, uh, uploading the stems so that people can be able to um, remix other people's work, um, it actually allows you to um, upload a, a project from certain DAWs that they support, so Logic or mm -hmm. Sheet or I, I think probably Reaper is another mm -hmm. one. Um, and I think it all syncs through Dropbox, and so it's kind of like maybe it doesn't have the uh, the artistic um, promotion side to it, but it's more about the remixing um, of other people's work. And I think they allow uh, Creative Commons licensing on theirs as well. So, uh, but that's a kind of relatively new thing. We covered it in the show a few weeks ago. Um, I signed up for an account and I haven't done anything with it yet because um, I, I just haven't got around to it. But uh, I, I was interested to know how, how much they overlap CC Mixter and and Blend. Um, well, it sounds pretty interesting. Um, I'll have to go check it out. Um, usually, we try to look at anyone who could be perceived as a competitor, find a way to turn them into a partner. Mm -hmm. So, like, uh, Gemendo, they're a partner. SoundCloud, they're a partner. Um, uh, Indaba. Because even any site that is, enables community and remixing, they, they always want more source, right? So um, our, our sam a lot of those sites will pull in our sample pool and our acapella pool and make it available under Creative Commons so then the artists in that community can interact with our samples. Um, we're working right now with SoundCloud to do a, if you upload something to CC Mixer, you can push it automatically to, to SoundCloud. What sounds cool about Blend is that you can automatically update from your actual uh, software. So if you're mm -hmm. using Pro Tools or Reaper, and that's a pretty cool feature. We don't have that yet. I'm jealous. I want it. I, um, I think it's quite yeah. like a, a GitHub or a, a Git type idea. So it's like repositories yeah. almost. Um, yes. Yeah, Our I, software I, I is on GitHub. Much. So um, if any of you are, we're always looking for people to contribute to our code, and you can go to GitHub and find uh, our code for dig.ccmixer.org there and also ccmixer.org. Um, uh, if you go to dig.ccmixer.org and click on site credits, there's a, a link right there to where our code repository is on GitHub. And so we're always looking for people to help us make it better. Cool. And I suppose yeah. another, another question is, because uh, Scott and I run a, um, a kind of, a, it's a, a project-based thing called Creative Pact, which uh, we did um, a couple of months ago. Um, and the idea being that you take on a pact, you say, I'm going to do this for a month, and every day you try and do a little bit of that kind of thing. And it strikes me that actually going on to CC Mixter and um, trying to create music from other people's music and then putting that back into the community and kind of tracking it would be a really good pact. Has, has anyone done that kind of thing before? So kind of project similar to that? Not so formally and I love that. Can we do that with you guys? Yeah. Will you, will you take the pact? Will you come join us at CC Mixer for a month? Hang out? Yeah. Well, <laughs> right, do some re in all your spare time because you have nothing else to do. <laughs> Well, some of us have more spare time than others. <laughs> we do. Um, we just finished something. Um, it's called a secret mixture, where um, people in the community sign up, 
and we kind of put our names in a proverbial hat, if you will, mm -hmm. and uh, it's all you know super technical behind the background. I run a little auto generate and it assigns people someone to mix and then someone's assigned to remix you but it's all done in secret so you have two weeks and you have whoever you get assigned you go and listen to all of their stems and their remixes and their source material and you create a new song that's half of them and half of you okay. and then on upload day we all share our mixes so everybody on Sunday we all listen to music we had 70 songs to listen to it took me I think six hours to listen to all the songs and review them and it's a great day because everyone in the community comes together because they have been mixed and they're mixing someone else and we all get to listen to what new things arrive in a, in one day that's mm. pretty cool so a bit like secret santa but without the presence and with more music yeah the present is the music <laughs> <laughs> but yes it's it is a little bit like a secret santa it's pretty cool cool Awesome stuff. Well, I, I have to make a confession to our listenership in that we, we have, um, a, there's always lots of uh, interviews scheduled and things like that that we're doing, and this is one that came out of the blue to our listeners because they wouldn't have known anything about it. We normally announced the week before. And the reason for that is because I noticed that you guys are actually running an Indiegogo at the moment to meet some funding needs. So could you tell us a, a little bit about that and what people might be tempted to uh, to pledge for or contribute for? Oh, well, and I really appreciate you raging out to us for that. Um, very cool. So our Indiegogo campaign URL is igg.me slash at slash ccmixter. They have such wonderful URLs. You can also go to ccmixter.org, and in the upper right corner, you'll see a picture that says help keep ccmixter uh, CC Mixer open and free. And there are very cool perks if you go and um, and contribute. If you want to get 500 bucks, you'll get your own original song. And um, but the music that we create is pretty good, so I think um, that's a that's a fun level. You can give ten dollars and get a um, free digital download. There there are all these different levels, but really the point is. Um, Giving to CC Mixter enables us to keep creating music, so it gives musicians a place to interact and nerd out together, because we're all musical nerds, um, and, and in the world of pop music where everything sounds like a McDonald's ad, there isn't a home necessarily for people like us so much, so this is a very um, special place. Our music is intellectual and motivating, and we just we explore um, theme-based projects, so you enable us to continue that, and um, enable shows like yourself and video game programmers and um, filmmakers and uh, educational institutions utilize content that that's not locked down. And we think that that's really important for the world to to contribute and support that type of sharing culture. Um, we are working with a couple of universities right now to bring our music directly our, through our API. They're building music repositories so students can use music in their projects and they don't have to worry about takedown notices or um, you know, issues. So that's one thing that we feel is really important. And Creative Commons, um, it makes it all happen. And we're, we, none of us get paid for the work we do, but we still have costs to run a, a you know, we're pretty we're growing really rapidly so we'd really appreciate your support indiegogo igg dot me slash at slash cc mixer <laughs> how's that <laughs> excellent stuff and I think you underplayed the perks there I'm looking at the the, the ten thousand dollars for a creative mountain retreat is uh, yeah you know. want come on it's still open you want to do it somebody wants to go to the creative mountain retreat right I think that's pretty incredible. Well, as long as Scott hasn't updated his computer in about seven years, I, I imagine that he might not quite have the money for that one. Oh, <laughs> I have a new computer, actually, but it's not really new. It's, I bet it's one of your listeners is a skier, and they want to go. You should see this house. So this, the, um, the house was donated by one of our members of our community, and uh, you should really see. It's amazing. It has, like, a movie theater in there, and it's right by... There's a um, snowshoeing trail right out the backyard and mountain snow. It's beautiful. Ten grand, come on. You, of course, you have to pay for your flight too. So it might not be feasible for you, but maybe someone over there is looking for a, a nice little ski getaway. Well, I, think, I think we've got some uh, U.S. listeners, haven't we, Scott? We, we have quite a lot, actually, yeah. 
And of course, um, you, and any listeners who are interested in checking out the Indiegogo can head to um, also head to our notes. We've got a link to both uh, the mix, the CC Mixer website, and the Indiegogo campaign. There, that's uh, the audio forward slash show forward slash one three five. So good to get that in. That's cool. Oh, let me. I'll model the T-shirt for you. Okay, let's see. Hooray. This is a CC Mixer shirt. 100 bucks donation, 100% organic cotton made in the USA, no slave labor, you know, no chemicals. Oh, here's the sticker. Oh, and the sticker as yeah. well. Oh, right and, cool. oh, wait, here is the album. Season of Gratitude, we're coming. You said it was almost Christmas. This is, like, the coolest and hippest holiday album you will ever hear. It's no Irving Berlin and, you know, Jingle Bells and all that. It's It's... Very unique and eclectic. It's like the beatnik album of holiday. It embraces all holidays, not just Christmas. And then the B-sides are like the dance mixes. So you got like some dance mix holidays. I, I, I don't think there are enough Christmas songs set to a rave backing. I think we really need a bit more of that in this world. Right? I mean, you would really, that with this album, you would listen to it all year and you wouldn't really know because it's not overtly Christmas. It just has that nice, gentle touch of some icicles and snow and, and a disco ball here and there. Subtle sleigh bells, isn't it? That's the uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> There are a couple more traditional ones. Let's say. Now, Emily, uh, j just, just before you go, I, I know that um, as well as being part of um, CC Mixer Tour as well, you actually make some music as well, don't you, that people might want to check out. Is there a way they can find you on, um, find the music that you make on CC Mixer Tour? Yeah, so my name is Snowflake, and um, there are, if you go to ccmixer.org, and you can either look under people or, um, you know, we, we do need some help with our uh, our programming, our web page. So it's, it's not the easiest to, to find people, but I'm ccmixer.org slash people slash snowflake, and there's all sorts of music. You can also use our API. You could query and find out find all my pels, find all my samples, find all my remixes, remix me. If you remix me, um, I will donate $10 to the CC Mixer um, Indiegogo campaign for every remix I get. So far, I've paid $500, and um, if you remix a track I wrote called All of the World, um, it's a song about CC Mixter, then I'll donate $20. Ooh, there we go. So, come remix me. Join the mix for station. That's, what, that's a, a conversation we use a lot. The mix for station. That's really what it's like. Awesome stuff. Well, thank you very much for giving us a little bit of time. What is, I know, very early in the morning for you, so we're, we're very grateful for that. Thank you, thank you very much for making that allowance for us. And we hope that your uh, Indiegogo is very successful for you and that CC Mixer will continue long on into the future because we find it a... I thank personally you so great. much. Thanks for having me, and um, I hope you and your listeners have a beautiful evening there. I'm going to go gr drink some more coffee now. Excellent stuff. Well, thank you very much, Emily. Thank you very much for your time. Cool. Thanks. See you guys. Well, there we go, guys. Uh, CC Mixer. If you don't know anything about it, I cannot recommend looking into it enough. It's um, a great. It you know, it's a cool source of uh, Creative Commons licensed materials that you can you know, if you're ever needing something just to cut into a mix to get a feel for something, or you want to look at, you can do. And um, while a lot of it isn't. Uh, while a lot of the material is NC, so non-commercially licensed, you obviously can approach the people individually to secure licensing for that later on if you if you wanted to. So it's a, it's a good way of you know it's a good way of getting source material, and there's loads of cool information there and a great community of people making music with that sort of feel to it. So mm. and really of like course, it. you have to remember that Scott's version of Early in the Morning does does include 10 a.m., which is uh, it was 10:30 where Emily was, so that's that's very early in the morning for Scott. Anyway, shall we do the news? Into the news it is. Oh, I like the new uh, news jingle, that's nice. That's, yes, just, it's a and, new jingle we got. And in fact, the, the first news item is the CC Mixter Indiegogo, so uh, yeah, make sure that uh, you head to the audio podcast at forward slash show forward slash 125 first news item, and you can get the uh, the links to CC Mixter's website and their Indiegogo campaign. 
So I'm jumping out momentarily here, but Pio, the uh, audio library written in Python, has a new release, version 0.7.3 is out and available now. And we hope to have an interview with the Pio developers really soon, actually. So that is uh, that's pretty cool. Also in the world of audio programming, uh, Roly have acquired the Juice library, which is kind of cool. So Juice is a library used, a C++ framework that's used in a lot of um, audio app, audio applications at the moment. Developers just tend to flock to something, don't they? And I think Juice just happened to be the one. Roly have now bought it, so it's got a kind of safe it, pair of hands, it, which it's is got really a cool. big. It got a big boost, I think, because it was used for Max 5. I don't know if it was used for 6 and 7, but it, uh, that was a big thing about Max 5 was the all-new interface, and it had uh, Juice as the... Am I right, or is that Max 6 I'm thinking of? I think 6 was Juice, if I remember correctly, but I wouldn't want to say definitively, actually. Mm. Mm. Let, let's, just, let's just say, if only Sam was here and carry on. Yes, yes. Um, and then we're going to go back to... Um, okay which is uh, an article, uh, basically, it was originally uh, on the Financial Times, they broke it this morning, uh, but I'm linking to the uh, Guardian one because the Financial Times website is a bit of a pain in the ass. Well, uh, it has like a pay paywall, doesn't it? You can only read so many articles in, in a certain yeah, time. It, it's eight, and it puts up a huge, even if you haven't got to eight, it shows you a bunch of the thing you're trying to read, and then it sends you to the front page, which is really helpful. Um, the article is about um, Apple's plans for Beats. They, it, it's broken cover, and it sounds like it's going to be a an app uh, that will link in with the Beats catalog, the Beats streaming music service, and that will probably become one of these stock apps on iOS, so it'll come automatically on iPhones and iPads in a um, a future iOS release, I suppose. Um, the main reason is to take on Spotify as the market leader of streaming music. Um, Scott, what do you think about? Uh, I mean, I, it, it stings a lot of the uh, the U2 thing where something is forced on you and you didn't ask for it. What do you think about? Is it fair for Apple to be able to just put on an app straight, load it straight onto phones and iPads? Um, therefore bypassing the possibility of someone making a choice. I, I, I actually don't really have a lot of problem with that. I, I even thought the U2 thing was a little bit overblown, to be honest, because being, uh, being in the Android handset world myself, really, like I have an Android mobile phone, I'm quite used to, in the morning, waking up, discovering it's ran an update overnight, and I now have a different set of features to what I had when I went to sleep that evening. And you you kind of gain things but lose things at the same time, whereas Apple at least are consistent. You, know, you tend to gain functionality more often than lose it as well. But this is slightly different, though. This is them actually trying to carve themselves out a niche in another market through an app that's... To me, it has tones of... You remember when uh, Microsoft were you know got a huge fine for their Internet Explorer, defaulting to Internet Explorer and not giving people the choice of browser. It's very similar to that in field to me. Even though Apple have done that for years and years as well. It's only because Microsoft were so dominant in the browser market. I, I think in this story, though, the, the issue is that I, I always thought that Apple were going after Beats because they wanted, well, you know, Apple sell things, basically, and Beats are a pair of high-margin high margin product that sits along their side there they were offering perfectly. So it was always a good fit for them, if not a bit expensive, what they paid for it. Mm. But I think with with Beats as the streaming service, has always been a well-respected streaming service, but one which is perhaps a little bit kind of ghettoed just in terms of the people. It, you know, Beats is very polarizing as a company. A lot of people are just not interested in them because they just view it as overpriced and garish. And that was always going to be a problem with the acquisition. At the same point, Spotify are in a lot of, Spotify are starting to get themselves into real trouble, I think. Um, there's a, a later later on in our show notes, so you can go and take a look, there's a, a link to a bit of journalism from The Guardian, again, who have looked into the counterclaims between um, the Taylor Swift camp and Spotify, which resulted in Taylor Swift withdrawing completely from Spotify. And while there's been lots of half-truths on both sides, I think, what became incredibly clear was that... Um, Spotify were offering very little money for, well, relatively very little money in terms of what the industry is used to getting for playback. Mm. 
Well, well, we, well let's talk about that when we get to that what that that article. But one thing I that comes to my mind is I wonder if um, because I didn't even know there was a Beats streaming service before Apple bought Beats and everyone was talking about it. I wonder if Beats managed to strike some pretty good deals with the record companies um, and that's why that's maybe why Apple see it as a kind of shortcut. It's like, oh, they've got some good deals. If we buy them and those deals remain in place, then we don't have to spend ages talking to the record companies about streaming, about sorting out some streaming stuff. I don't know. And that's a complete guess. No, I, well, I, I think you're absolutely right. I'm saying Beats, Beats always had a very, very good and proactive relationship with the industry, mainly because obviously its founders and executive board are all actually involved in various parts of the industry already at mm. the point they made it. So Beats definitely secured a good set of deals in, in terms of starting that. And not only did they secure those deals, but it was reported at the time, uh, I think Financial Times, or no, New York Times reported it, that they'd secured those deals with transferal rights as well. Ah, okay. Something that not everybody else got. So I think it's radio, though. I'm not certain here. I might be wrong. But a couple of the players in this space do not have the legal right to sell on their access deals. So it means that those kind of companies are literally almost worth, or, well, I don't want to say worthless. That's really harsh. but They're worth it, something in their own right, but it's not worth someone to buy them. Because they lose the thing. Like It's like, hey, I've got the a streaming service. And loads of people subscribe to it, but the minute I'm bought by anybody, I lose the ability to stream the audio to them. It's Yeah, and it makes sense for Apple because, you know what, they, can, they don't have to mess with the Beats brand for headphones at all. They can basically just continue exactly as they were doing before. No interruption. They, it's just they get the profits from selling headphones and not... Well, you know, obviously the people who work at Beats will get some profits there too. It was probably just that was probably just a nice sweet little thing alongside the um, alongside possibly getting into the streaming game a bit easier. So, you know, pieces coming falling into place. I think that was what we can see happening here. Yeah, I think it's pretty cool. You know, something I'd love for them to do if it was possible, but. Um, I listen to a lot of podcasts. So I guess our, listen, our listeners will probably listen to a lot of podcasts. And I often find myself in a situation where I'm listening to a podcast, and when the podcast finishes, what I'd really like is just for my, you know, like I have an iPad that I listen to podcasts on. I really would love it if it just started to play some random music for me. And mm -hmm. then, you know, I could then say, here, let's have another podcast, you know, I have another podcast episode or something after a bit of music, and I could just, you know, go do that. And it, this would be a really nice opportunity for Apple to like put some linkage in place. So I could see like a beat streaming audio sort of thing, but then taking in some sort of podcast feed into it as well and putting the two bits together would be really cool because right now having I, iTunes Music and the podcast app as two completely separate things with very little interplay relationship between them is really frustrating. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you what though, I, I think... I don't know if Apple care about podcasts anymore. It's kind of like the way that they care about music in that the music can make the money, but actually the music apps in the new iOS releases are not really very good. They've actually taken a step back, and like we know Apple as being the I the makers of the iPod, but their music experience, if you have a big library already and you need to sync it with your phone, the experience has actually got worse over time If if that's the way that you consume music. Um, let's move on. Um, Indeed so. And we've got a couple of uh, DAW newses right now. Indeed so. So uh, Bitwig have released version 1.1. So there we go. I, I, I see you've described it as the new door on the block. Yeah. Like yeah, yeah. Well, it, it is really, you know. It's, before Bitwig, it was Studio One, I would say. But now uh, Studio One is not the new door on the block. Um, but yeah, version 1.1 um, comes with uh, some advanced VST multi-out and sidechain support. Um, I think that's, they're filling some gaps because there are, there are some notable gaps in the first version of Bitwig. Um, there's proper latency compensation now, better uh, routing of audio and MIDI. What I'd like to know is, is there proper MIDI out routing? Because I don't think Bitwig 1 had that. Um, MIDI out to like um, your keyboards and your MIDI yeah. modules and stuff. I, I wonder if that's what that is. Uh, various other things. You can go to the Bit, Bitwig website 
and find out more. And you can also find out about their um, their sale, which is 20% uh, off the price of Bitwig Studio until the uh, 15th of January 2015. So cool. if you want to buy Bitwig, now might be the time. Ableton are also running a 20% discount sale at the moment as well of uh, Ableton Push and Ableton Live. That includes all the different, the three different versions of Live and also includes an accumulative discount against educational pricing as well. So Ooh, if you qualify for educational pricing for Ableton for Live, then this is an additional discount on top of that discount. So And there's also a discount on Push as well, isn't there? Yeah. Mm, nice. That's a that's a tasty piece of hardware. I'm not going to buy it. I've still got my machine studio sitting right here, so that's it not. It is, a... isn't it? Though I was thinking about the push actually, just that it's it's what a year old now. Six, it's definitely six nine months. Oh, it's easily nine months old. I'd say it's yeah. probably a year old. Yeah. So I just I I just wonder if there's you know, like. I, I think it's a great piece of hardware. I've played with a couple of them. I really like it. And I somebody asked me whether they were they were asking me for a recommendation. They were like, or oh, should I go you know, they were gonna get live and they were like, should I get push as well? And I was like, Well push is a lot of fun. It it's a lot of fun and it's a cool tool and I I really like it. And then they were like, But hasn't it been around a while? And I thought to myself, Well yeah, nine months is ah. of hardware. That's that hey, if could... you think about like other controllers that like well, the original true. machine's been out for a few years, hasn't it? Yeah, I guess so. They upgraded it, but it's been out for a little while. The thing is that machine and la and push are kind of seen as competitors, and they are because uh, they kind of do the same thing, but they do them quite differently. I think. I think having a, a machine and having a, a having a push are a quite a different. It's quite a different mix. But I don't know. Maybe maybe one day we can compare them properly. That's true. So ju just briefly, we I don't want to go back in the Spotify news really, but Adam said that we would quickly mention back to it that there is a Guardian article which discusses the Spotify Taylor Swift dispute, and after some after some kind of journalistic effort, they've established the reasons for the disparity, the huge disparity in terms of the numbers as well. So it turns out that Spotify are quoting what one party is quoting global figures, and the other party is quoting U.S. Oh, stream okay. only figures and then the, the two the figures were Spotify said that they paid her or her record company six million dollars yep. and she said only 0 0.5 million dollars yeah but they were saying six million for the whole world and she was saying half a, half a million for the US and I, I think the issue is simply that they think six million for the US would be the appropriate number and the rest of the world would be a greater number again on top I mean I wonder if we, we're getting to the point where like previously, if you bought a CD, the the unit count is CDs is is the 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 physical release. You never got paid. Well, maybe for radio you did, but you didn't really get paid per play. And that is what's changing now. Is there's a there's a way of being able to be paid for the number of times your track is actually played, not for spending ten, someone buying your album for ten pounds and being able to listen to it ad infinitum um, until the CD breaks or until whatever. And I think, and and that is, I think you're absolutely right there, Adam. And I think at the same point you've highlighted the real problem of the of the whole situation as well, which is that it's a very small and niche set of music which is played over a prolonged period of time. And to be honest, I think the industry is responsible for that. They've built that environment themselves, that most music is increasingly, the majority of music is seen by the majority of people as largely disposable and something they listen to a few times and then never bother listening to it again. Because when you were selling CDs to people, that was brilliant. And now the problem is that with that sort of environment, it's, impo it's impractical to ever really see most music breaking even if the idea is that once they've been played a hundred million times they're broken even which is yeah and for for a small artist you know it's impossible like being on Spotify is good because it means that people can get to your music but you're not never going to see any kind of money but then maybe through recordings you probably wouldn't see much money anyway so 
Ah, I don't know. It's, it's it's tricky, but I mean that's really the kind of marked thing that's happening with Spotify in the Spotify thing. Is Spotify's brought about this uh, this this change in how things are built, and I think the music industry is a bit like, um, hey, wait a minute, we should be getting more money for that, and then Spotify saying, well, I'll tell you what, we're not making enough money to give you that much money. So, I, I'd imagine that it's probably an equation that can't be solved. You know? it, it's very true. Um, I, I think for anybody who's listened, is interested in this, it's it's something that the industry's gone through many times before. Basically, every time a new format turns up, the the sky falls in almost. And it's it's interesting to read the history of like cassette in the in the mid seventies and <laughs> the kind of nightmare that that was. But what's interesting is. Um, I've been doing a lot of reading about the emergence of the compact disc and the reason, you know, various things for it, and I, I won't kind of go into that in any real detail. But what's really interesting is that when you get to 1986, 87 in the CD, in the story of CD, this incredible moment happens where you not only do people start replacing music they already own onto CD, they're willing to pay twice as much for the privilege of doing so, and then the label the major labels discover they can resell the entire back catalog again onto CD and yeah. i remember i'm sure you remember those kind of days where CDs were like 13 pound 14 pound mm -hmm. and the, you can imagine that the the markup on a 13 pound CD of a recording from the 1950s was just going to be huge i'm saying that's like yeah. There must have been over twelve pounds markup on that, and you can imagine for an industry to go from twelve pounds markup twenty years ago, or like twenty, twenty, twenty-five years ago, to now where we're talking fractions of a cent. That's, you know, I mean, like, you you can see the problem. It's just it's insurmountably huge. But then the music industry has always been really, like, they can't overtake technology. Technology defines. Mm defines music and how music is made and how it's disseminated and how it's enjoyed they have to be faster to basically to realize what the technology is capable of and then do something to help or to be part of it rather than to constantly fight against it constantly fight against it because they won't win because it's what we want it's it's probably the only bit of democracy that we actually get any kind of control over it's it's kind of uh, we we've gone a bit political here. I think maybe maybe we'll we'll step back. But uh, well, uh, let let let's step back from our political our politicalness. And you know what? It's time to do some pirateering. It's whoa, blunder. blunder. And quickly, Scott, I'd like to say that that thing that you mentioned that you were reading about the CD. I think mm -hmm. that'd be a, that might be a nice uh, bit of plunder if there's a if there's an online version. But maybe for next week. Maybe maybe for next week. So first of all, Adam, I see that you have continued the ever continuing adventures of Kickstarter Corner, and I see you found an expressive MIDI guitar system. I have. Um, there, there's some interesting um, and and some pretty cool looking music tech stuff on Kickstarter right now. This is one of them, the expressive MIDI guitar system, and it's basically um, it, it's it's a guitar form. It's a it's a MIDI controller that has a guitar form, but really. And you can use it as an electric guitar as well. It has uh, some single chord pickups um, set into it, and it has a fretboard, it has strings. But you can also use it as a MIDI controller. Um, but it's slightly different to your kind of stock Roland or um, Yamaha type thing in that uh, it picks up, it kind of picks up the frets. Uh, it really turns the fretboard into a kind of controller. So rather than holding your fingers down and strumming, you can actually use those as switches, the uh, the different frets and the different strings and that kind of thing. Um, the Kickstarter video does a good uh, a, a good demonstration of it, uh, but you you've also got some additional controllers. There's a little joystick. There's the pick guard is basically a kind of touch interface, so you can do stuff with that. All maps to uh, to MIDI controllers. Um, you can plug it in. I think via MIDI, definitely by USB. And uh, and it, I think it's quite a high quality product. It looks like it. It's got this nice colourful tunnel thing where the sound hole would be. So it looks kind of psychedelic too. Um, quite expensive. Um, the when I put this up on the seventeenth, uh, three days ago, um, there was an option for a four hundred and forty nine euro 
expressive guitar system. That was the cheapest, 549 including a hard case. Um, if you're interested, head to Kickstarter to well to our notes. You can get the link to the uh, the Kickstarter project there, and you have until Tuesday the 25th to pledge. Um, they've already hit their targeting goal, so um, you should receive that thing if you pledge now. Cool. Mm. If you're into um, analog and digital synthesis and you also enjoy uh, 80s cheesy graphics and moustaches, I see, Adam, you found a, a, a YouTube video which will, yeah. uh, which will meet these needs. I was trying to find uh, I was trying to find some material to um, mess around with and put into a track, um, and I like sampling stuff. And I came across this. Uh, it's a two-hour long video, but it's the whole of the first series of uh, Steve DeFuria's uh, secrets of analog and digital synthesis, which is actually, it's pretty dry, but it, I think it goes into a lot of information about, um, it starts with the fundamentals of, of sound, like, you know, it's a, it's a pressure wave in air, and, um, you know, if you're going to synthesize it, then you need to know about the big three, which is uh, pitch, timbre, and loudness, and uh, then he kind of builds up those concepts, and then he applies them first to analog synthesizers, then to digital synthesizers. He gets into FM synthesis. He's got his DX7, you know. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting thing. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. And our final, uh, final item of plunder here, again, is a return to old hardware. But um, I, I was... Um, well, I've been doing a lot of research about historical music tech equipment recently, just to... Just because I have been, and uh, I discovered that Le um, Lexicon maintains an online list of old hardware, which I thought was kind of fun. So there's a list of or every box they've released with their name on it, pretty much. So I thought that was kind of cool. So, does you know, it link to Does it link to information about those products, or is it just a kind of flat list? I don't really remember. Actually, I could take a look. Quick look at that. Be, that it's really really helpful when you go. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Yep. Oh, excellent! It's good. Can you download like the manual and stuff for it? Oh, come on, Adam! I'm saying that's you know, hey, right. our listeners want some excitement, some discovery. I don't think I'm asking too much here. It's useful when you want to buy an old okay. piece of kit. And yes, you can. Excellent. There you go. You can, they basically they've PDF'd the manual, and you can download it, and that's what should happen. Yeah, there you go. That's cool. So that that is indeed that's indeed the case. Yeah. Okay, and, and with that, Scott, you know what's happened. We have come to the end of the audio podcast for this week. We, we have indeed. Don't forget, if you've enjoyed the show, feel free to uh, subscribe to us either on YouTube or on iTunes. You can also find us on Gpodder, Stitcher, and various other places. Um, you know. mm -hmm. And this week we, we didn't, uh, because we had Emily Richards on earlier, we didn't have our, um, our imagery. Our, we, we've done normal YouTube um, camera shots this week, but I think next next time we'll probably switch back. I was ready to. I had one ready, you know. I had a good one ready as well, actually. But it's yeah. all right. We'll do it next week. We'll get Sam back, and we'll do it next week. Yep. Uh, Sam sends his apologies. He uh, he wasn't expected this week. He had a, a pre another a family arrangement, which is perfectly acceptable. So that was perfectly fine. There we go. So um, thanks once again to um, Emily Richards of CC Mixeter for jo joining us at the start of the show. That was great. Um, I, I really hope that Indiegogo goes well. Um, mm -hmm. Adam, I hope you've had a fun time on the audio podcast show 135. I, I have. I have. Mm. And I hope, Scott, you've had a good, a good time the same. And I, I, let, let's bring our A game to the next show. Excellent stuff. We'll see you later. Goodbye. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.